Buenos días a todos. Eh, Hello, good afternoon everybody, and uh, it's, uh, Portuguese is going to be spoken here now, and I think that it's a language that is easy to understand, I find it difficult, and my accent is neither Carioca nor from Bahia, I'm Spanish and I've uh, been uh, working in Brazil for three years, uh, working for MAPRE, and I'm sure that you will understand and be perfectly. The only one that's not going to speak Portuguese is myself. I'm going to be talking in what we call Portuñol, which is uh, a language that is spoken very much in our company, and I'm sure that you'll understand much better still. But for me, it's an honor to be here. Firstly, I would like to uh, thank you for allowing me to form part of this meeting. I've only been working for MAPRE for 12 years, which is a very short period of time. And until very shortly, I used to watch these things on television. So firstly, I would like to uh, thank you for the opportunity for being able to be here. And I think that it's a luxury too to have these guest speakers because they are extremely well-known people and, uh, with lots of recognition in the Brazilian market. And I think that they are the most suitable um, speakers to talk about this reality and to talk about the challenges, opportunities, and threats eh, that exist in such an interesting muy market. Right. Ellos, right. Ellos and very briefly, well, they breve, are going to deliver very short presentations because we understand that the most important sus, part of the business sus, has to do with your views eh, and with your Alves, statements. And Cristiane Alves, sitting to my right, is the chairperson of the Brazilian Association of Risk Managers, and Daniel is sitting to her right, who works for the Derbrecht Brokerage Group, and he is the risk uh, manager of uh, Braskem, which is one of the uh, big Odebrecht. companies that forms part of the eh, other Resh group sitting on my left. Carlos Carlos is Jose Carlos Jose Carlos Carlos Carlos, who is the deputy chair of Ibu Brasil, which is the main eh, insurance network in Brazil. And uh, finally, eh, our Luigi colleague Jean Luigi Jean Cristofano. Eh? <laughs> Your name is uh, very Luigi difficult to pronounce, is, isn't it? Luigi. Uh, Luigi is, el is uh, the CEO Brasil, of uh, Willis Brazil, el punto and he's going to be broker, uh, pointing out the broker, point of view of a broker in terms of the local Brazilian firms, and without a doubt, and I know that uh, his opinions are going to be very valuable. But in any case, firstly, I would like to ask Cristian to deliver her very brief presentation. So, thank you, Cristiane. Good morning, everybody. Firstly, I would like to thank Mafre for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm going to explain why is it I'm here today. This is an event that uh, started many years ago, and it uh, has a lot of recognition in Brazil. And when I was listening to my boss, my boss said that he was going to participate, and I, well, I really felt like coming here, so that's why I'm very happy to be here, because I'm going to be able to talk about my culture, about my country, and about risk management. But I think that you're going to have a much better understanding of the uh, challenges we are dealing with, because the... I'm from the Brazilian Association of Risk of Management. But one of the main aspects, or one of the main uh, characteristics of a Brazilian person is optimism, because we say uh, that God is Brazilian. So if God is Brazilian, that means that we are protected and that we do not need to be worried about anything, because everything is going to work out perfectly well. Well, if God is a Brazilian then, and if everything is going to work out in the end. Why is it that I have to manage risks? Why is it that I have to subscribe an insurance policy? Why is it that I have to prevent risks? Well, of course, there are some historic and politic and uh, geographic aspects that do corroborate this approach. Because historically speaking, it's a country that has never had any wars, 
it uh, does not have any terrorism. And until 1993, Brazil was a country uh, that had uh, economic instability, which was a factor that made things uh, difficult to subscribe the policy. But since then, we've had a very high level of inflation and prices were constantly changing. And this made it very difficult to uh, subscribe an insurance. And uh, geographically speaking, the country does not have any catastrophes. It's not been affected by catastrophes. We have no earthquakes or hurricanes. And apart from that, we have lots of natural resources. And then there's another important factor, which has to do with IRB before it became a private concern. And uh, that is uh, the former IRB Institute, uh, colleague Cardoso isn't here, but it was an underwriting organization. And let's say that this allowed us to, in Brazil, well, we, this helps us in two respects, because we say that uh, grandparents spoil their grandchildren. So this was um, a government body, which uh, was a monopoly, and this makes us feel very comfortable. It was a very comfortable situation for us. But when it was... Uh, made private, we had to do all sorts of things to reach an acceptable level of risk management. We needed to have a technical knowledge on insurance issues, but we're still learning about this. And this makes us draw mistaken conclusions like God is Brazilian and I'm not exposed to any big risks and I have no reason to buy an insurance policy. And if I do have to buy an insurance policy, there's somebody there to help me. So this is what made us have a completely mistaken um, opinion as to why we were supposed to do any risk management. But nowadays, our country has a, an accelerated economic growth. If everything goes well and if uh, people allow us to work, we'll be able to get back to our usual channel of development that uh, started back in 1993. 80 million Brazilians left uh, poverty and have now become the middle class and they have completely different prospects in terms of insurance. All of uh, them are very concerned about uh, losing what they've uh, conquered. So, in other words, they're going for insurance policies and there's also a very big niche for micro insurance policies. We have natural, abundant natural resources and we have a very diversified economy because we are strong in terms of uh, agriculture, industry and as from 2012 the civil law entered into force and has um, made it possible to clarify the different uh, liabilities affecting the parties involved and there's also access to the internet to more information and all of this means that we we have a completely new movement in Brazil that uh, has uh, grown a lot in these recent years. In spite of the things that are being done mistakenly by the current government, but anyway, but there have also been some climate changes. There have been tornadoes, well, not very intense tornadoes, but they do happen from time to time, and also uh, flooding, and that's a, very, that's a very usual kind of thing in our countries, and we also have an open market. And talking now about uh, the ABGR, the Brazilian Risk Management Association, it was established in 1983 with a group of risk managers, and I'm not sure if uh, they were called that. In any, case, in any case, insurance managers, and they got together in order to exchange information and to understand uh, what the market was like and to see what each one was doing in their own companies because there was not a single source of information. It was something completely new, risk management, that is. It was a completely new field, so it was something that uh, people didn't even talk about. And uh, then the ABGR was the end result of this uh, discussion process. 
And the main mission is to uh, develop and disseminate risk management practices in Brazil amongst its associate members and amongst the risk management community through the uh, media and through the internet, through workshops, seminars, projects, etc. But what is it uh, we're providing incentives for in ABGR? Because we need to draw up a, a business plan. We have to have to build more business contact analysis and we have to work with the quality of the product. And we have to think about issues that have to do with uh, civil uh, liability, product recall, new risks related to catastrophes in the supply chain. And then something else that's extremely important, that can also be found at some of the companies which has to do with the issue of benefits, in other words, health, which is a complex subject in Brazil and in many other countries too. And then we also have the part that is related to pensions, uh, pension plans. Thank you very much. That's all I dare talk to you about right now because I don't have enough time to give you any more details. Vamos continuar con eh, José Carlos Cardoso, vicepresidente de Irbi de Brasil. Ricardo Cardoso. Let's move on to the next speaker. Buenos días. Y como ven, mi portugués está un poco distinto. I'm afraid that my Portuguese is somewhat different, and as uh, I've been working as a reinsurer for 20 years, I'm going to try to deliver my presentation in Spanish. It's a great honor for me to be here today. So I'm going to try to deliver my presentation in Spanish, and I love the Spanish language. Well, this started back in 1939 with the uh, establishment of the Institute. And the interesting thing is that this was established because the Brazilian government was afraid about uh, the uh, onset of World War II. And uh, there was, it was said that the premiums that were exported abroad would never come back because of the war problem. So that's why they decided to establish the Institute of Reinsurance of Brazil. And it was a monopoly for many years until 1997, which is when the um, opening up of the country occurred, which is when the IRB Corporation um, was established. And, and then 2007 came along, which was a very significant turning point, which is when the end of the monopoly occurred in Brazil and when the market was opened up. And the IRB had 100% in the market, but it dropped down to 20% in that period of time. But, well, you can see here that Irvi is, uh, proves the fact that uh, God is Brazilian, although the Argentinians say that the Pope is Argentinian too. But anyway, so in 2013 there was a restructuring process because it was absolutely fundamental to be able to survive in this new scenario. So significant changes occurred internally by hiring more professionals until we reached 2014, which is when the privatization process took place with the IRB. And in 2014, the IRB was the main reinsurance uh, company in Latin America. And when I say this, I don't feel very comfortable because, yes, we are big because uh, we are big in Brazil, but our presence in Latin America is pretty incipient. And for that, I have uh, your support. But anyway, the IRB is 76 uh, years old and has lots of experience in terms of reinsurance. It has a solid capital structure of uh, $1.1 billion, which, according to the Seoul Institute, and represents something like two times more than the minimum amount that you require for this purpose. And then the return on equity over the last uh, five years has been 20%. And we have a rating that has been given by AM Best, and that was in November last year, and it's a minus.
And we also have the Brazil market. We have a market share of 34.3% of the country, which is something about uh, like uh, 47% in the case of local reinsurance firms. And I'll explain how this uh, local market works. So this is the shareholder structure. So once again, it uh, gives the IRB uh, some very significant financial help. Because we have the three most important banks in Brazil as our main investors. And then we have the Brazilian government that has 27.6% of our shares, of the golden shares. And the other shareholders well, are some insurance uh, companies like uh, Porto Seguros or other investment funds too. And here you have the figures of uh, recent years related to IRB, and we're going to see that in spite of the fact that the market has opened up, we have achieved a significant degree of uh, growth. And what is even more important than that is that we have uh, focused on the bottom line. Because what you can see is that our net um, revenues, well, last year we had a record figure of 602 million in the revenues or profit. But as you can see, the conversion would be $1 equal to 3 reals, more or less. So we have a combined index of 88% and a loss ratio of 58%. And and we had a ROE of 24% in 2014, which is a problem because now our investments want us to continue along this path. And uh, finally, I don't want to make you suffer too much uh, because of my Spanish, but these are the main lines of business of our company. And well, property, property accounts uh, for a very significant chunk, about 30%, and agriculture, farming, and well, it's uh, something like 22%. And then I wanted to draw your attention to the part that has to do with the international side of things that approximately accounts for 11%. And this is where we have the major challenge, and this is where we have the reasons why six months ago I decided to change companies and to take on board this significant challenge as a Brazilian. I think that after working for 20 years for multinational corporations, Operations. I wanted to um, address this uh, challenge to close my professional career so that we could take IRB to another level to become a significant player by focusing on the Latin American region and the Iberian Peninsula as well as some African countries where we have more similarities in terms of uh, language and other um, cultural aspects and things. And, well, basically that's all I wanted to explain, and I don't want to take up too much time because I know that it's going to be very good to have the Q&A. But what I did want to do once again is thank MAPRE for allowing me to be here today. MAPRE has been an extremely important partner in Brazil. And I think that it's a reference for us, and proof of the fact is that, well, we've been invited to come to this seminar and to attend this session, or these uh, two days of sessions. So that's it. And now, well, later on, we can uh, address your questions. Thank you very much. Obrigado, Cardoso, pela presentação e pela por compartilhar o risco de falar outra língua também. We're going to continue with Luigi San Cristofa. Boa tarde a todos. Em primeiro lugar, gostaria de agradecer muito a Thank you very much. I would first like to thank uh, Mafre uh, for uh, giving Willis uh, the opportunity of taking part in this uh, very important uh, event. Uh, 
and uh, David very especially. I would like to say that uh, Mavre is a fundamental and strategic partner for Willis in Brazil and in the entire Latin American region to uh, carry out our main business model uh, related to uh, major risks. And uh, I'm going to be talking about this uh, for five minutes uh, during my presentation. Before starting to uh, discuss our business model, I would like to give some figures and landmarks about Willis. I'm not going to say too much uh, because uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you uh, know Willis. But Willis in the world has uh, 17,000 associates an integrated network with uh, 400 offices in over 120 countries. We have uh, an annual income of uh, close to $4 billion. We uh, manage a premium volume from our customers of around uh, $30 billion. Uh, we have uh, headquarters in uh, New York and London, and we're listed uh, on the uh, New York uh, Stock Exchange. This uh, chart uh, shows where Willis is present in black, either with its own offices, in most cases, or through uh, representatives. Willis is uh, present uh, in uh, practically all the uh, major decision-making centers in the world. And uh, talking specifically about Willis in Brazil, we've been present in Brazil since uh, 1958. Therefore, uh, a long time in Brazil with uh, offices uh, in the main uh, cities of uh, Brazil. We have 400 associates in Brazil. We work uh, for uh, 1,600 uh, corporate clients. And uh, regarding human uh, capital, uh, to give you an idea, we uh, manage uh, 800,000 life insurances in Brazil. This uh, is uh, more than many uh, local uh, uh, underwriters have in their portfolio. And we have a position of leadership uh, in the uh, major risk uh, segment. And uh, this uh, is uh, uh, a big difference uh, with respect uh, to our competitors. And we handle around a uh, billion dollars in insurance and assurance. On this uh, slide, I wanted to say a bit more about it, because even though it's uh, a straightforward uh, image, this is our business model in uh, Brazil. And it explains uh, the success uh, we've had in our work with uh, major clients. At Willis, uh, we are sure that uh, nobody uh, can be very good at everything. We have to uh, choose uh, the segments uh, we're best at. And uh, for approximately uh, or 15 years ago, we decided that uh, Willis in Brazil would be the best solutions for uh, large uh, clients. So uh, we uh, adjusted our business uh, to uh, work in this type of uh, segment. And uh, the gears uh, shown on the slide have meshed and are working in a highly organized manner. And uh, they're highly synchronized, uh, always uh, looking uh, for the uh, greatest uh, benefit uh, for our uh, large clients. Uh, and these are the three main gears the uh, insurance operations that we call retail, that uh, works uh, uh, every day with our customers, but uh, also provides access uh, to uh, Brazilian assurance companies, uh, large, very capable uh, companies. The uh, second gear is uh, the assurance operation in Brazil, in Willis, uh, Brazil, where I'm the uh, CEO, and uh, the uh, Willis Group. In other was the world presence of the group. We use the best uh, resources, uh, the best human resources available in our group uh, to serve our customers. In the case of uh, Brazil, especially in relation to uh, property, a strategic uh, partner for us uh, is our London office.
and uh, this, these gears work very well. And uh, to give some examples, there are cases or uh, customers where we see that the uh, local uh, Brazilian uh, market is uh, responding better to certain risks. So uh, the uh, other two offices or the other two uh, gears uh, provide support uh, to the retail uh, office without uh, participating uh, in the uh, business position. And uh, if uh, the case is involved in the insurance market, the retail group uh, provides support, but uh, the uh, London Assurance Office uh, carries out the operation. So our focus uh, is always whatever is best for our customer, what uh, are the best opportunities we can uh, provide worldwide. And uh, because we have uh, such a successful uh, assurance business in Brazil, Willis has been selected by a prestigious publication as uh, the uh, best uh, assurance uh, broker last year. And to end my presentation, these are our customers or our main customers in Brazil. Well, in fact, uh, uh, most of them have been working uh, with us for a long time, 5, 10, 15 years or even more. On the first line, we have uh, the uh, major uh, Brazilian companies, uh, CSN, Bale, Petrobras, uh, Botorancin. Willis uh, works uh, with uh, practically uh, half of the uh, large corporate risks in Brazil. We also uh, work uh, with uh, automatic contracts, uh, and here uh, the uh, companies are the uh, insurance companies, and we also have major customers in Brazil, uh, two of which are present here with us. And this is an honor for us, Mapfre uh, Seguros and we IRB. And this is uh, what I had to say, so I'm going to uh, sit down with my colleagues again, and I'm at your disposal for uh, any possible questions. Obrigado, Luigi. Por último, Eduardo, por favor. And finally, uh, Eduardo, risk uh, manager at Braskem. Good uh, afternoon. I'm uh, not going to uh, take the uh, risk and to try to follow the steps of my colleague uh, Cardoso, because uh, about uh, five words are all the Spanish I know, so I prefer to speak Portuguese. I would uh, first uh, like uh, to uh, thank uh, Mafre on behalf of our group for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here in Spain, in Bilbao, with the opportunity of exchanging opportunities with this group uh, and especially uh, with my colleagues from Brazil. It's important to highlight uh, that uh, in the culture of our group, uh, which also extends to the way we uh, manage risk, uh, a close relationship uh, with our partners is uh, fundamental for uh, the results uh, we uh, want to attain. So this uh, invitation and this uh, event uh, reinforces uh, the uh, relationship and is uh, completely in line with uh, what we uh, try to develop within our policy. I'm going to be uh, very brief. Uh, I only have uh, one slide uh, for my presentation. And uh, we can start by talking about uh, Braskem, a uh, company in our group uh, which has 50% uh, of uh, the group's uh, uh, turnover uh, worldwide and uh, amounts to over $20 billion. Uh, Braskem uh, is a leader in the Americas in the uh, production of thermoplastic uh, resin. We are present all over the world with 29 plants in Brazil 
five plants in the United States and uh, two plants in Germany. Another important uh, aspect uh, is our uh, project in Mexico, a project uh, amounting to uh, about $5 billion, uh, which is uh, about to uh, complete the construction phase and will come into operation at the beginning of next year, I believe. Our plants are very strongly uh, concentrated and naphtha is uh, the uh, main uh, raw material. Everything in life is made up of uh, cycles and there was a time where naphtha was a more interesting raw material, but nowadays uh, shale gas is uh, very important in this market uh, and uh, is uh, an ingredient uh, that uh, increases uh, the challenge for brass chem in the future. The uh, good news is that our plant uh, in Mexico is gas-operated. Gas is the raw material. And this uh, diversification of naphtha and gas, this uh, provides a balance that uh, will uh, probably provide very interesting results. Braskem is a relatively recent company. And uh, Braskem uh, started uh, around two uh, basic areas, the construction of uh, new plants, such as the new plant in Mexico and other plants uh, in Brazil. But uh, it uh, also consolidated uh, a continuous cycle of uh, acquisitions, integrations and consolidations in the local market in the last decade in Brazil. And uh, this uh, is a very interesting point uh, because, in fact, uh, the uh, company's uh, life cycle uh, so far always consisted in transferring cultures and values, uh, making use of the values and good practices we acquired from uh, other companies uh, through an intense uh, process to transfer culture, knowledge, good practices, something we uh, firmly believe in. And a good example of this in 2009 was the acquisition of some plants in the United States uh, with uh, North American culture. And nowadays, uh, when we visit these plants, uh, whether in the United States or in Germany, we can see uh, that uh, there is uh, a uh, culture that uh, has been uh, passed on and uh, the results of which we can now reap. When we look at the uh, geographic uh, distribution, we find uh, a uh, company that uh, investment grade listed in uh, most uh, capital markets and it's difficult to imagine how such a complex company without considering the intrinsic risks of the uh, petrochemical industry we're all aware of the dimension and the scope of those risks, it's uh, difficult to, to think about uh, surviving without uh, being very careful about uh, risk management. I can uh, guarantee that uh, risk uh, management uh, is uh, a very important issue in our organization, not just in Brescam, but in the entire Bres group. Uh, the uh, risk management culture at uh, Brescam is uh, world class and uses global parameters. And uh, apart uh, from uh, this uh, risk uh, management and the long-term relationship we have uh, with the insurance and assurance market, this, uh, I believe, uh, guarantees uh, good results for the company. Risk management is a fundamental ingredient uh, for uh, consolidation and to uh, guarantee the results of our company. Desde o nosso CEO, 
I believe uh, that uh, this uh, is uh, very important and is top-down from the CEO to the plant operator. They all know uh, the uh, risks involved uh, wherever they work and uh, what they can do to uh, contribute uh, to improving the company's results. I firmly believe in this uh, model, the model we have at the company. It's a company that's growing. And uh, a good example of uh, the uh, work we're doing uh, can be seen in the results uh, that are being achieved because uh, it's uh, not uh, enough uh, to work hard. We have uh, to achieve results. Hard work uh, is uh, uh, the means, uh, but the end is the results. And all this has led uh, to uh, important results. Uh, for two consecutive years, the uh, company has uh, exceeded uh, $2 billion in EBITDA. And this has been uh, very positive. Uh, and uh, this provides... Uh, support uh, to uh, the company leaders in their businesses. And uh, I would like to end by saying that as uh, risk uh, managers, uh, we shouldn't uh, believe uh, in luck because it doesn't exist. And uh, I would like to take the license of uh, quoting uh, Cervantes, uh, where he says, persistence is the mother of good luck. So uh, we uh, believe in risk management uh, and persist in risk management and believe that we will uh, obtain good luck with this persistence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, thank you all. Now, a brief uh, uh, presentation, or we've had a brief presentation of the context of Brazil as a market and as an insurance market, and we'll quickly uh, move on to the questions, which without a doubt is the most interesting part. Some very general figures. Brazil is a country with 200 million inhabitants. It's the fifth most populated country in the world. And in the last uh, 10 years, uh, uh, Brazil has had a 24% growth in the middle class. We're talking about almost 100 million inhabitants, 50% of the population that can be defined according to the established standards as being middle class, a consuming middle class. Another 50 million are still uh, poor, people with uh, less uh, access uh, to purchasing power. But uh, we can see that uh, this growth is expected to increase in the coming years. Brazil is the seventh uh, largest economy in the world. It's uh, an economic system that uh, is very much influenced uh, by uh, production and uh, export of commodities and the uh, business sector and the insurance sector are influenced by this. 60% of the exports are raw material, and almost 30% is uh, food products, 5% uh, sugar, 3% coffee, 7% uh, soya, the uh, most uh, exported products. 16% is iron ore exported to other countries, mainly China, a major world consumer, and 9% oil exports, uh, a country where most of the oil produced is uh, for uh, domestic consumption. Brazil is a 12th uh, in uh, premiums issued in the world, and it represents 50% of the premiums issued in Latin America, also included in the Caribbean area. Therefore, the size of the country and the size of the market uh, is obviously uh, considerable. Uh, enormous. Even so, we believe uh, that what the uh, insurance market represents in the country's GDP is a small percentage, 3.76%. And compared to uh, 10 years ago, 
eh, tiene un incremento importante. It has increased significantly from 2.51%, but we still uh, believe that there is room for growth. The uh, current context, we've seen that uh, our dear friend, the Real, has uh, been uh, kidnapped by uh, the dollar. And uh, uh, we've seen a 40% devaluation in the currency, and this obviously uh, means uh, certain risk, certain situations that need to be managed. The inflation, for example, is more expensive to import uh, products, and Brazil is the country that requires uh, importing many uh, products it doesn't produce. And um, this is affected. Uh, less foreign investment, obviously, is a risk uh, that uh, may exist, uh, and an increase in energy costs, uh, because the parameter to establish uh, prices uh, continues to be the dollar. Other drops in prices uh, experienced uh, by the world in general and uh, where Brazil is suffering uh, more. 50% of the uh, price of iron ore in 2014. In the first quarter of 2015, uh, a 15% drop in the price of steel. The main cause is uh, an uh, excessive production capacity. There's more uh, production than demand at the present time. There's still a low international demand, uh, mainly uh, from the leading uh, consumer market, China, because of a slowdown in their economy and also because of uh, uh, more uh, internal production systems that are enabling them to self-supply uh, themselves with this raw material. So this has a direct uh, impact on the uh, Brazilian economy. A 60% uh, drop uh, in uh, the price of oil. And this is uh, well known um, by everyone here. In six months, uh, we can see that uh, we're talking about a uh, hundred and some dollars. Now we're talking about uh, fifty dollars. Uh, per barrel of oil. This is direct impact. Petrobras is responsible for 85% of the country's extraction, although it's not a closed country, it's not a closed sector. Other operators uh, can uh, freely operate on the Brazilian market, but even so, uh, Petrobras has a dominant position, and this has an obvious impact on the local economy and the uh, national economy of the country. And there's also a direct uh, impact on the uh, Presal project, uh, a new project that Petrobras is carrying out, and this uh, project has the aim of reaching uh, a million barrels per day. And uh, this uh, project is uh, at least under analysis right now. The inflation expected for 2015 is expected to exceed 8%. It's not a dramatic figure, and it's all comparable if we compare with other countries. But uh, obviously, it's uh, a figure that we didn't expect one, two or three years ago. Therefore, it's a, a new framework uh, that we all have to work in, and this means risks like uh, lack of trust in the markets, a reduction in internal consumption, no doubt, and doubts about the possible uh, measures uh, that uh, the uh, government uh, is uh, starting to implement to control the deficit. Another uh, characteristic, unique aspect this year or especially last year, is uh, that it hasn't rained. It's rained very little. And uh, it's, that may not seem very relevant, but it is, and very relevant for a country like Brazil, a country where 80% of the energy they produce is hydroelectric. Uh, Therefore, the raw material is water, and that's fundamental. This uh, picture, uh, not the cartoon, the picture is real. It's a real picture of uh, the uh, main uh, reservoir uh, in Brazil, which is currently at 50% capacity. This picture was taken a few months ago, not many, but it's a real photograph. So again, it's a problem that has a direct impact on the situation, and um, it's something we need to understand and manage. According to the uh, IMF, the uh, draft, the draft alone, is going to have a direct impact on the GDP of 1%. That surprised me, such a direct uh, relationship on the production of a country the size of Brazil. And we're also witnessing a, a significant increase in... Uh, accidents or claims. Uh, Cardoso, you're no doubt suffering this to a larger extent. 
The hydroelectric plants and the thermoelectric plants, uh, many of them are uh, working uh, beyond uh, the uh, optimum uh, capacity, and this is having uh, an impact uh, on incidents and on the insurance and assurance market. This is the context, but even so, we believe that there are still major opportunities uh, in this uh, enormous market. And we discussed uh, the size of the economy earlier. The Brazilian government uh, investment plan continues. And uh, what I've personally seen in these last three years is that it's true that the investment rate is not what was promised uh, by the politicians. And uh, this uh, doesn't just uh, happen there. We also uh, suffer this in Spain and in other countries, I'm sure. The uh, politicians promised a number of measures, but in reality we've seen uh, that they didn't uh, move forward at the rate promised. But many of those investments have been carried out. Metro lines that didn't exist before, metro lines that are being built, large-scale metro lines, hydroelectric uh, reservoirs in uh, capital letters. So probably at a slower rate than promised, but they are being carried out. These are some of the future investments, public investments, that are going to be made in the country. We're seeing that although the economy um, may drop into a slight uh, recession, the insurance and assure uh, market uh, is uh, expected to grow. Why? Because uh, the weight is still too small. The influence on the GDP is small and uh, consumption is increasing. So, uh, therefore, again, these aren't hopes, they are realities. Even though um, the economy uh, follows a different rate, the insurance and assurance uh, market uh, we uh, see uh, will uh, carry a greater weight in relation to the GDP. And the insurance uh, rate uh, in the country is still uh, very low for a country that has 50% middle class. Only 12% uh, uh, have life insurance, only 40% of the cars are insured, and only 5% of the homes are insured. Therefore, again, this is just uh, an example that uh, illustrates uh, the uh, room and scope we uh, still have, fortunately, to make uh, the companies grow. The 40% uh, growth over uh, the next uh, four fiscal years, including, well, last, year's, last year too. So we see uh, lots of rural growth and the agricultural insurance policies and what we call the agro-insurance uh, still has a very low level of penetration relative to what it could achieve. And without a doubt, this is a wonderful opportunity for the the insurance and reinsurance markets and uh, special risks will uh, the uh, home insurance policies uh, property lines motor lines uh, liability financial lines well in all of them we can see that there are ex lots so there's lots and lots of growth expected but specifically in terms of uh, major risks uh, the expected uh, growth is a uh, 32 percent in these years we can see well you can even look at the chart that goes all the way up to 2018, from to 2010 to 2018, and this is the growth that we've uh, seen and which is going to happen in the next few years. So in spite of the somewhat uh, turbulent uh, economic context, we as a sector, as a business, I think that we can continue with a robust growth. And uh, what about the main uh, branches? Well, property, oil and gas, and aviation, which are the branches that we understand that to have more prospects for growth in terms of the global uh, business and that is uh, major risks in the next few years in our market and well we are nearly there we are nearly there and 
Agora vamos passar um pouco a, a parte das well, now, well, I'm going to move on to the questions, which is the most uh, significant part. I know that we're running out of time, but uh, in any case, uh, well, let's, um, well, let's uh, use up a little bit more time because I believe that this is the most interesting part when you listen to the speaker's answer. And the first of the questions has to do with the uh, future prospects of the insurance sector. And I would like uh, you to start, uh, and considering the current uh, context, the current uh, macroeconomic context we've seen in Brazil, so which, uh, from your point of view, are the main impacts that could affect our sector? In the case of the insurance and reinsurance sector, but do you think that apart from the significant challenges, do you think that there are opportunities that would allow us to invest? Well, can I answer in I can answer in Portuguese or Spanish? Well, I'm going to continue in Spanish. Well, firstly, I'm I'm not going to say that I'm the oldest of you all, but I'm well. Let's say I'm the less uh, young person. But I've seen Brazil over many years. I've seen Brazil go through several crises, and this obviously. It scares uh, people uh, living abroad. And it also scares us as Brazilians. But in any case, but this crisis, uh, from my point of view, is uh, much more political than financial. But why am I saying this? Well, a couple of weeks ago, I heard a former minister of economy use an expression that says that the photo of Brazil is very bad, but the film is very good. And I think, well, that's more or less what he said. But in any case, in the past decade, Brazil has received some very important investments. I think that after China, it was the second country that received uh, most investments. So the industrial um, component of uh, Brazil has grown. It's a completely modern industrial sector. It's all there. And in the last two years, Brazil has climbed to the fourth position, and it's the fourth largest car manufacturer and the second largest airplane manufacturer. And I think that this is something that perhaps uh, only a few of you knew about. But due to a bad political administration of our country, especially in the last two years, we did uh, whatever we could. And uh, this now answers your question. Is this going to have an impact on the speed of growth of our country? This year, however, I've not seen any infrastructural projects underway, or nothing has been announced by the government or by Petrobras that is also uh, involved. So this year, is there going to be an impact? Well, I suppose so. But what I do believe is that one of the characteristics of Brazil has to do with uh, the speed with which uh, we react to these crises. And uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, I don't know, well, if everything goes well, we are very persistent because we are Brazilians. We are very stubborn. And uh, we learned that uh, as, uh, when in our country when we had an inflation of 2,000% in only one year. So we are used to that and in reacting very quickly and we react extremely quickly because we have a minister of economy that's good and he's now putting on the brakes to what that very well-known lady did in Brazil. And then this lady, who's very well-known, who's still in the government, unfortunately, but she um, handed over political control to the vice president. So in in a way, the country right now is um, readdressing the right path. It's going down the right path again. So I think that uh, for the next uh, 18 months or so, we're still going to suffer from the consequences of these uh, bad moves. But then after that, we will be ready to readdress growth and to continue ahead. 
completamente com yes, a I agree. I fully agree Talvez with um what uh, you've just uh, pointed out noite. in your analysis, Cardoso. I'm a little younger than he is, not that much though, but I've I already saw that happen before. I've seen that Brazil has undergone crises that seem to be terrible, and that it seemed that Brazil was never going to recover. But these uh, crises were overcome, and. Uh, they were followed by a movement of recovery and a growth, by significant recovery and a growth. So I'm very optimistic as regards Brazil because all of the uh, components, all the solid components are still in place. We have 200 million uh, people. Um cedo, like uh, some of our colleagues mentioned previously. And there's a constant growth of the Brazilian middle class. So in other words, that means that it's more and more consumers that are now becoming involved in the economic sector. So this uh, provides a very extensive base for consumer for consumption. We have a very solid banking system too in Brazil. I think it's one of the most solid and one of the most sophisticated systems of the world. We are a democratic country. We have uh, free companies, uh, free trade, and we have a solid base. The foundations are extremely uh, sturdy, and we are now having a um, political and financial crisis in the world that obviously affects us, because let's say that there has been a drop in the price of commodities, of mineral, and iron, uh, which are the mas, uh, represent the base for the uh, Brazilian economy. Uh, but in any case, I'm totally calm Brasil. and I'm very positive Acho about uh, Brazil and its future. I think that any company, any company that uh, wishes Brasil, to do business uh, in Brazil or that would like to invest certo, in Brazil, uh, I think that this é is a wonderful alternative. I think that we're on the right path. Brasil, but in any case, uh, we need to um establish a long-term vision because Brazil is a country that is still in a development stage. It is an emerging country, so its growth will never follow a straight line, a constant straight line. It would not be constant linear growth we're talking about. So we'll have some uh, better years, worse years. We'll have uh, good uh, politicians, others that are not that good. And Mas this is num, something that will happen over the next years. But in a more extensive analysis, I think that for the last 10 years, well, there has been growth and Brazil will grow in the future, and I'm very optimistic. But if we take a look at what Brazil was like 30 years back, you'll be able to see that Brazil is uh, nowadays a much, much better country compared to what the situation was like back in the 80s. And Amen, please. Well, yes, I only wanted to make another comment in relation to what Cardoso said. I think that what you said is all well and good, but I would like to uh, deliver a completely different point of view on the market in terms of the major risks and uh, to say something about how we envisage this situation in Brazil. Well, some important things first, because the crisis, although it's a temporary thing, I think that this is going to produce a much more significant reaction in the risk ponto, sector, at least in Brazil. And then the second issue is uh, connected to the uh, reduction of options we have nowadays in Brazil with regard to the insurance companies or insurance groups that want to um, cover these uh, major risks or corporate risks through network capabilities to get this done. And I think that this is going to create a very attractive opportunity. Why? Well, because the insurance group 
that is strategically sure that it's going to be dealing with the corporate risks, sees that in Brazil there are certain doors open that perhaps a few years ago did not exist. So there's a consolidation that is very significant. And then there's another uh, issue regardless of the crisis. We cannot deny it, of course, because we've seen it here. We live in a relatively soft market and as we have a relatively soft market, the thirst for taking on board risks regardless of what you decide to do or not is diminishing. So in other words, what we have to do is develop a specific response to the market. We have to be much more competitive and we have to offer much more interesting options. And I think that in what David said, I think that there's an impact well, together with some of the crises. I think that this is a wonderful opportunity for the companies that have defined as a core business anything that has to do with corporate risk. And Cristiane, uh, you are here uh, representing the group of uh, risk managers. What is your view? Well, as far as the crisis is concerned, yes, I agree with what has just been pointed out now. And I also believe that in terms of uh, politics, we should uh, continue with the same situation. Because if the ARB is allowed to do what it's uh, supposed to do, well, we might be able to overcome the crisis. And Brazil has to go back to basics again. It has to go back to the growth it was ex experiencing. Well, we have all the conditions. As uh, Luigi said, Brazil is a country with 200 million inhabitants. It has a very extensive domestic market. It also has abundant natural resources, as I said previously. And I think that we're going to overcome this uh, situation. And I agree with what Eduardo said. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to uh, diminish uh, tension and to open up the market space to open up the market to insurance and reinsurance. Well, I, I'm going to uh, bring both of the questions together to speed things up. In recent months, what we have observed is that in Brazil, <coughs> new risks are cropping up. Um, we, people that didn't have this kind of experience, thought that this would never happen. Financial and political and environmental risks and also image risks. Some of the large Brazilian uh, companies have been affected by this. So, in the case of the large Brazilian companies, do you think that they are aware of these risks that are cropping up? Have they measured this? Have they measured their exposure to these risks and the impact this could generate? Are you taking any preventive actions to reduce these risks or to eliminate these risks? So what is the role played by reinsurance or by insurance companies or by brokers in this completely new context connected to new risks? Are there new solutions for these new risks? And uh, the advice uh, from brokers and, uh, well, the the best <coughs> option in this variable scenario we're dealing with right now, I think, that, well, shall we start off with Daniel? Yes, I think that, yes, we are aware of these new risks. And the, the major difference is that this has an impact on the results of a company. So it doesn't suffice for you to quantify this risk and to perform an observation, but you need to know how to deal with this. Because perhaps some companies in addressing this risk, well, they observe the risk, they identify the risk, and they detect that risk, but they do not apply the right kind of treatment in order to mitigate or to trend suffer or understand or even eliminate that risk. So I think that this is an issue that, from my point of view, is clear. And this is perhaps one of the ingredients, well, I'm sure that it's uh, one of the ingredients. It is one of the ingredients that will be able to uh, produce much better results for the business. 
So the issue of new products and new solutions, I believe that once we have identified the risk, we're talking about a vocation, and let's say that there's a willingness to understand this risk and therefore find a solution. But what happens in reality at certain points in time, as that, well, even in uh, some insurance companies, there are certain regulatory aspects that postpone the implementation of solutions that could be available in other regions of the world. And this solution, or these solutions have to be transferred to Brazil, as I pointed out to David. We really have a very clear idea, and we know that the process is a little bit slow, but the risk is present. So if the solution is slow and the risk is present, we're dealing with a gap there. And you can just imagine what could eventually happen because of that gap. And I think that, yes, uh, we could um, have a joint action carried out by the customers and the insurance companies and the reinsurance firms so that we can try to provide solutions of this kind that will be able to address these uh, new risks in Brazil. I think that there's a market for this, and Cristiana, your opinion, please. Well, I think that the large corporations, they also manage to identify and they also have a perception or they observe these uh, new risks risks all these new exposures. And uh, what we have to look into is uh, the way we are going to deal with situations of this kind. In other words, uh, what they believe would be the most suitable action from the point of view of the company. And in the case of uh, SMEs, I believe that this is still yet one of the challenges to be uh, coped with, which is something we see at ABGR. In other words, we have to make them understand things about even the most basic insurance policies until we reach this level. So this is not one of the problems that we only observe within our organization in ABGR, because we we also had a problem last year with the Latin American Association of Risk Management and Insurance. ADRIMA is in North America, and PARIMA is the association in Asia Pacific and there's also a European association, and the answer was exactly the same thing. It was unanimous, because when we moved on to the level of SMEs, it was difficult to manage risks. And identifying exposures was even more complex, but as regards uh, commodities in Brazil, we have this uh, difficulty of what already exists outside Brazil because of a regulatory thing, a regulatory issue. The uh, regulation applicable to many of our products, well, sometimes it's a little bit slow until you can implement new solutions, not only for products or commodities, but also for any solutions that we can provide to deal with risks. But in any case, this is another of the challenges that we have to deal with. Carlos, please. Do you think that the market is uh, presenting uh, suitable solutions in relation to these challenges that are um, put to the customers? Well, not yet, but before, I would like to um, um, support what Cristiana and Eduardo have said. I think that we have to separate the major risks and the intermediate risks, because the major risks through risk managers could have a structure, an identification structure, and we could also develop solutions. And as regards SMEs, well, there's a pretty important gap there. And I believe that the main market for brokers and for insurance firms like Mafre, for instance, well, this is an important niche. It's a significant sector, and which I think you can make use of in order to disseminate this culture. Because even when we observe our results, that is, accidentability is at this level of SMEs, and it's not related to larger risks. I'm more uh, concerned about a supermarket and less concerned about a steel plant. And I think that this is a good opportunity. And as regards to commodities, well, unfortunately, in Brazil, 
Durante uh, muitos anos, o IRB tomava o bom e o mau risco. Ou seja, não, nunca se estimulou a cultura do gerenciamento de riscos. Tanto o mau cliente como o bom cliente compravam o risco. The good customer, the bad customers, bought risks practically for the same price, and good risks were eventually subsidizing bad risks, or rather good risks. Sorry, and this this is going to take this going to take time, take some time. Some bad customers querer comprar proteção e não encontrar. I'm not going to want to buy protection, I'm not going to find it. And as regards products, the situation is still very slow as regards implementing solutions that do not agree with the market, and it's a very slow process. Junto com os but in any case, it's not in our hands as insurers and reinsurers together with our customers. We are not supposed to identify and quantify these demands. And this would have to do with the, um, the executive management of risks. But I think that we have to take on a much more proactive role. And we have to demand more respect for our And they have to give us some kind of answer. And if it's a negative answer, well, they should allow us to find a solution outside the Brazilian market. Thank you, Luiz. Yes, in Brazil, we have a regulatory body, which is called SUSEP, and SUSEP regulates the, the insurance market and the reinsurance market, too. And some of the products that are available on the market uh, suffer because of this regulation. It's a problem we have in Brazil. We have to coexist with this because it is there and things are going to continue along those lines. It's not a criticism, it's a reality because this regulatory body, SUSEPE, is there and we must bear this in mind and we must try to uh, work to coexist in the best uh, possible manner with this situation. But regarding this issue from the point of view of a broker, from the broker of insurance and reinsurance, which is what I do, and as part of this function, we have to always establish much better market conditions and the best solutions in the market to put them at our customers' disposal. And I say that it's true when we say that, uh, well, recently at least, there was never so much a supply of capability in the market, and never before was there so much thirst, so much demand on the part of the insurance and reinsurance uh, firms in the case of certain uh, segments, and it's completely natural. And uh, at a point in time like now, with uh, for each customer, each customer has their own experience with the market, and this experience is going to be defined. Is going to define the specific characteristics of each client, and. And the perception of the market based on the uh, risk that the customer is uh, facing and the accidentability record. So these are the criteria that are always going to be uh, fundamental as regards uh, the success of a customer in a market or the opposite. And this is even valid in the current market context. But uh, generally speaking, what I dare say is that without a doubt, this is... Uh, well, this is one of the most favorable markets in uh, these recent years for the uh, purchases of reinsurance and insurance. Thank you very much, Luigi, Eduardo, Cristiane, Cardoso, for your presence. It's a great honor to have you here on this panel. Thank you very much, Cristiani. Well, I would like to I would like to thank the I would like to thank our colleague from Chile. And I would like to ask all of us to uh, take on a commitment so that we can perform uh, risk management properly as a priority. I think that's one of our mission as brokers, 
of uh, insurers and reinsurance firms. Last week, we held an event in New Orleans, and at one of our meetings, uh, the biggest concern had to do with uh, training and education, rather, and in the next uh, five years, 50% of the risk managers and insurance and reinsurance people will be are going to retire. And the concern is that they do not have qualified staff to uh, cover these vacancies. So if anybody's interested in sending your CV, this is going to be an interesting option. But I think that we have to think about this, because some countries have not provided the training which is essential. So this is one of the important things. As a representative of uh, my association, I would like you to please uh, give value to our profession. Well, thank you all very much indeed. I hope you found our panel very interesting. Goodbye, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye for now.